Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we're boarding passengers seated in zones E and F at this time. Your zone number Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Crew Travel right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome back my co-host, Lee Hare from ATPI Travel. How are you, Lee? Yep, very good. Yeah, it's uh, been a good start to the week. Busy, busy, which is a good sign. But yeah, ready for the show. Nice, of course. Actually, let's start off with what we're knowing is coming for the entire summer. Paris strikes. Yeah, it's not the first time we've talked about leases. I think it's almost like a regular feature we have now about Paris airports and strikes, isn't it? But Paris, Charles de Gaulle and Paris Orly Airport, which are two of the largest hubs in France, are expected to experience delays and flight cancellations between June 11th and the 13th. Uh, now, the main reason for these delays will be the walkouts announced by the union for air traffic controllers at Orly Airport. Now, it's not clear yet if flights passing over France will be impacted, but the last time that the union went on strike, 70% of flights at Orly Airport were cancelled. Now, travellers to these two airports are advised to stay up to date within the situation, to check their flight status regularly, and anyone who does suffer any disruption last minute and needs help, please do feel free to reach out to myself. I'm always happy to help. And to be fair, it's not just Paris. Seems that since we started doing this show back in the pandemic, Europe is. We've seen a few strikes over on the U.S. side. But it's really been in Europe that's the hotbed of strike action. Yeah, it is. I would say probably mostly the U.K. and France. They seem to be the two that really have the issue with strike action especially after COVID and whether it be contracts to be renewed or not enough stuff or working conditions, whatever it is, it does really seem to be UK airports, predominantly London airports and France, again, predominantly Paris airports. Not going either any time soon. I'm good. Any news on what's going on in Palma? Is that still <laughs> happening or... As, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's still going ahead. Yeah. The over tourism activists. Yep. I've not heard any more, not yet. So as far as we're aware, their plan is still to blockade the airport at this time over the summer months. Great. I told my son that I would take him to the airport on the 28th just to make sure that he got on his flight. Coming back, he's on his own. Sorry. Yeah. He can fight his way through it. Yeah. He speaks my arcane and he can, if he wants to sit in the taxi for six, eight, 10, 12 hours. There's nothing I can do about it, right? Exactly right. No, you can't. So, so I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Really, I would never do that to my son. Moving on. The Birmingham yeah, so pass- yeah, Birmingham Airport, that's the one. Uh, passengers using one of the UK's busiest airports, Birmingham, have complained that they missed their flights due to building works, uh, which have resulted in lengthy queues outside the hub. Uh, disgruntled travellers took to social media to complain about the long waits. Now, Emirates, Qatar Airways, Turkish Airlines all use the hub and low-cost carrier Jet 2 also fly from there. Now, the delays are due to construction to the security area at Birmingham Airport, with the airport unable to give a confirmed date when the works will be completed. Now, what I would suggest at this time, passengers who are travelling from Birmingham is as follows. Firstly, make sure to arrive when your check-in opens. Don't leave it until the last minute. Uh, know your check-in zone at the airport. So for Jet 2, it's zone A. For Emirates, it's zone D. And all other airlines are zone B and C. Now, if you have checked in online and have no checked baggage, check the arrival time recommended by your airline and head straight to security, which is on the ground floor. And finally, just before arriving at the security checkpoint, make sure to have all metals and electrical equipment out of your pockets and ready, such as phones, coins, keys, etc. This way, it should at least speed up yourself to try to get through and make flights. Because like we said, it is literally people queuing outside of the airport terminal at the moment because of the building works. I bet you the largest percentage of complaining are the Jet 2 passengers that pay five bucks for their flight. And probably, yeah. That would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? I spent five euros to get on this plane to get to a beef ad to party in an all-inclusive resort for the weekend. Yeah. Sorry. Not sorry. And the easiest countries for Schengen visas right now. Yeah. yeah. So the med season is now in full swing, and with that comes the logistics of booking flight for crew. Now, obviously, whilst for some crew traveling to Europe, it is very stress-free, but for others, this means organizing visas, specifically Schengen visas. 
Now, for anyone who has had to apply for a Schengen visa, you will know it's not the easiest and most straightforward process. Now, the process of applying for a Schengen visa alone should start a few weeks before a planned trip to one of the Schengen states. Now, data supplied by Schengen visa statistics for 2023 shows that while some countries are more inclined to reject a larger share of visa applications they receive, there are others which tend to reject fewer visas. Now, filing an application to visit one of the latter means an applicant has higher chances of getting a visa. Now, according to the numbers, the top 10 easiest Schengen visas to obtain for summer 2024 are as follows. Uh, number one is Iceland with only a 2.2% rejection rate. Second is Switzerland, 10.7%. Latvia, 11.7%. Italy, 12%. Luxembourg, 127 Lithuania, 128 Slovakia, 129 Germany 14.3, Austria 14.3, and Greece in 10th place with 14.7%. Now, if you wish to visit any of the member states, apply for a visa at the visa centers of one of those 10 countries. You can always visit other countries with that same Schengen visa. Just make sure that the country issuing the visa will be your first destination. Uh, it isn't advisable at all to attempt to obtain a visa for one of these countries mentioned, and then try to enter another as your final destination, because that is considered illegal by the EU and is labelled as visa shopping. That's interesting. As a Canadian, I've never, ever experienced the need to worry about getting a visa anywhere. But if there are some sort of statistics out there that say which country it is the most difficult to get a Schengen visa from, yeah, there is. You can also get the information with regards to the one that, that rejects the highest amounts. Yep, there certainly is. And I can get that for you next week if you want to know who the most difficult ones are. No, not as far as getting the Schengen visa, but which countries have the most difficulty getting a Schengen oh, okay. visa? Whether you're from Sorry. South Africa, whether you're from yeah, yeah, where, yeah. wherever. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I'd have to, uh, I'd have, to have a look and see into that and, uh, and see if we can find that information. But... um yeah, the the issue as well is it's just trying to get a, a, an interview slot because obviously you normally have to go for an interview and hand over your details and take biometrics and all the rest of it. That can take months alone, let alone the actual application process itself. It's just trying to get that, just to get the interview in place. Hopefully, fingers crossed, anybody who is working in med season who needs a Schengen visa has already got one in place. If not, it could be a serious race against time. You have to do interviews now? I think so. Yeah, I think that you have to at least go down. I'm sure they ask for biometrics and stuff like that. Yeah, you de definitely have to go down to the the office anyway. Okay, you know what? Maybe it's just been a whole since I've had to apply like 20 years. Who's counting? <laughs> really? Oh, for me, it was just like you take a years. Can't be yeah. 20 years, are you? Yeah. You're not even 20 years old, are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll find out what you want later, won't I? Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now, a couple of weeks back, we talked about the airports loosening up restrictions and rules on liquid. We did. That's changed again, hasn't it? It has on certain ones, unfortunately. So, yeah. So rules limiting how much liquid passengers can take on planes uh, from a London airport are to be reintroduced. Now, the Department for Transport, or DFT for short, has announced the change, which says it needs to be made to enable improvements to security systems. Now, the change affects passengers travelling from London City, but also from Newcastle, Leeds, Aberdeen, Southend and Teesside airports. All who had scrapped the 100 mil rule, but have now put it back in place very shortly after scrapping it. Now, other airports had made no change to the long-standing rules on carrying liquids. Now, the DFT has emphasised that this is a routine measure and not in response to a specific threat. Now, people from these airports will only be able to take 100 mils onto flights. Now, a DFT spokesperson did say from 12 o'clock uh, midnight on Sunday, June 9th, so yesterday, 100 mil restrictions on liquids will temporarily be reintroduced for passengers travelling from the six regional airports, where the next generation security checkpoints are in full operation. Now, the temporary move is to enable further improvements to be made to the new checkpoint systems. I wonder how uh, much this stupid mistake cost them. Probably a million. And it's probably the brother-in-law of some high politician who got the contract. Yeah, but they're not going to pay their people. 
because heaven forbid they actually, but we're going to mess around with liquid amount because that yeah. makes sense for all of us. And Qantas has some changes. Yeah, so Qu- uh, Qantas passengers traveling uh, may notice new systems for boarding from Monday uh, today as the airline begins a rollout of new Australian first procedures aimed at speeding up performance times. Now, the improved boarding systems will be implemented across four major domestic airports, starting with Brisbane Airport on June the 3rd, followed by Perth on June the 10th, Melbourne on June 17th, and finally Sydney on June the 25th. Uh, now, while airlines have largely used systems such as boarding from the back to the front or seating premium cab- cabins, sorry, and high-ranking frequent flyers first, Qantas's new system will assign passengers a group number from one to six on their boarding passes, which will determine when the passenger can board the flight. Now, the location of a passenger seat in the aircraft will affect the number allocation, but cabin and frequent flyer status could also still be a factor. Now, the overhauled group boarding procedures will apply to all domestic routes departing those airports, so Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. The new procedures, which follow months of trials conducted from mid-2023, mark the most comprehensive change to the airline's boarding processes in over a decade. I don't know about you, but it just reminds me of being on a farm and grading your cattle. It's a bit weird because they say it's a major overhaul, but then when they list the things that are going to affect what group you're in, it's pretty much the same things that determined when you went anyway. Your your seat allocation, your frequent flyer status, you know, other than kids that's the only difference i can see that actually is going to make any difference whatsoever and i'm guessing probably kids are going to be the first ones that are going to be put on the flight anyway there's probably not going to be any change for that whatsoever hint what have not now announced it to me it's almost a bit like the emperor's new clothes they just decided to rename it something else and give it a number from one to six instead of a to F4, you know G, what though that. i can tell you what that was it was their marketing department saying we have come up with a great new way to get Qantas's name out there Why don't we just take away the letters and add numbers and then we have a reason to put out a huge announcement. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could be wrong. Um, If somebody is going to farm this on one of the routes and are going to be numbered one to six, if they can actually let me know if there is any difference or if they find the procedures easier or more difficult, I'd love to hear from it. Because like I said, to me, it seems a bit emperor's new clothes, but we shall see. Yeah, probably hear back in two weeks. They decided to change it back again because it just Just didn't work. Probably. And like the liquid, right? Oh, my goodness. And by the way, if anybody has a crew question that they want Lee to answer, of course, you can send him an email. We'll provide all of his information below this interview when it airs. Lee, I want to say thank you very much. You're going to be here next Monday, but the Monday after, no. No, that's right. Next week, I will be here. And the week after, I will not as I am traveling back to the UK. And you will be staying. I will be staying. I am relocating back. So it'll be nice. It will be on the same time zone almost. So your morning will be my morning. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be nice. I'll only be probably a two-hour flight from you instead of a 24-hour flight, really. So I could knock on your door at any moment in time. So be aware. I've never given you my address. We're safe. I'll, I'll find it. Don't worry. No, Lee, I want to say thank you very much. And I look forward to touching base again next week. Always always a pleasure. I'll see you next Monday. Nice. You've been watching another edition of Crew Travel right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I have been your host. And on behalf of Lee and I, we thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again next week.